We've been in a series titled, Get Up. And we'll have one more message in this series. It will be next Sunday. And the title of that one will be, Get Up, Your Church Needs You. But today, before we get to the church house, we're going to visit your house. And the title of my message this morning is, Get Up, Your Miracle Depends on It. Your miracle depends on it. Two years ago on the social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter, the Sesame Street page that runs the character Elmo, the red whatever it is, (laughs) puppet um, that was on Sesame Street, the Muppet that we grew up watching ask a rather innocuous question on Twitter, now X, and Elmo said, I'm just checking in. How is everybody doing? There were thousands of responses on this platform and the majority of the responses told Elmo that they were not doing too well. They begin to pour their hearts out to Elmo like he was almighty God. One of the responses said, I'm tired, Elmo. One said, the world is burning around us, Elmo. One said, Elmo, I'm depressed and I'm broke. Others told Elmo that they were anxious about the upcoming election. Many had to do with politics. One of the responses said, each day the abyss we stare into grows into a unique horror, one that was previously unfathomable in nature. However, I did have a good grapefruit earlier. Thanks for asking. I don't think anyone anticipated how many responses would come in from this one simple post from a Muppet. And many believe that uh, this question provoked feelings of nostalgia because many of us grew up watching Sesame Street. You know, I grew up watching Sesame Street. The Smurfs were the devil back then, you know, but I still snuck and watched the Smurfs too. Remember, remember mom, y'all scared us to death. We'd go to hell if we watched the Smurfs, you know. (laughs) Thousands of responses in 24 hours. The response that uh, the people who run the Sesame Street page gave was, wow, Elmo is glad he asked. Elmo learned it is important to ask how a friend is doing. And what I would say to you this morning is that we are in a difficult season in the world. There's division. We just came through a pandemic. People are struggling with what they believe. People are sick in mind, they're sick in body, and they're sick in soul. And I believe we need a move. I believe we need a miracle. And God's people must get up because your miracle and the miracle God has for others depends on you. Faith is a word we throw around in churches, but faith is a non-negotiable item in kingdom living. Faith is so important that the Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. And let me add to that, without faith, it is impossible to have God. Faith is the master key that unlocks kingdom living. The Bible says in Romans through Paul that we've each been given a measure, a metron in the Greek of faith, which means we've been given some faith to some degree. Each of us has a different metron measure of faith, but it's time that we call on our faith because our miracle depends on it. 
You may say, I don't believe I have any faith, Pastor Ronnie. I don't know that I have faith at all. Well, you do. If you've ever flown on an airplane, you're getting on a vehicle that's about to take you 30,000 feet in the air, driven by a person you've never met. If you have ever been to a bank, you hand over your hard-earned money to a perfect stranger and hope that they manage your money in a way that when you need it, you can have it. I tried to pay a rather large bill about two months ago, and I gave them my card, not a credit card, a debit card. There was money in my account to pay this bill. And they said, Pastor Phillips, we're sorry, but your card has been denied. And I said, say what? <laughs> I transferred the money. I, I have the money. And I found out, no, you have a limit. Well, I didn't agree to a limit. I had to call the 1-800 number, talk to someone I could barely understand, And that didn't work. So I had to call my friend, who's the VP of my branch in town, and wait two hours so I could spend the money I earned. It takes faith to give money to a perfect stranger to fly in an airplane. How many of you, when you came into Abba's house this morning, got down on your hands and knees and looked under the stadium seat you're sitting in to make sure it was bolted in properly <laughs> so that when you set your blessed assurance on it, <laughs> it was going to hold it up. Yes, sir. Don't tell me you don't have a measure of faith. No. It's Woo. what we have to live in every day. But we put our faith in the wrong things. Jesus was constantly preaching the kingdom to strengthen the faith of his followers, his disciples. He was teaching them things and performing miracles because he knew he would ascend to the Father and through the Spirit, they would have to walk in greater works by faith. And people are watching your faith and they're either being challenged by it in a negative or a positive way or they're being strengthened by the faith they see in you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Jesus would say to those disciples, if anyone has the faith of a mustard seed, you know, a mustard seed's very small, but it's referred to as a nuisance, the nuisance seed, because once it's sown, it grows anywhere and everywhere and attaches itself to anything. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to that mountain, move, and it will move and be cast into the sea, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Faith, the key that unlocks the kingdom. And as I studied through this series months ago, I knew I couldn't preach a series on coming up into your purpose without this particular passage of Scripture. Mark chapter number 5 today, beginning with verse 21. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there with me. We do have the Bible in the sky. As my friend Beth Stevens Johnson said just a few days ago, consider that stolen I like that, the Bible in the sky. Jesus had just crossed the Sea of Galilee seven miles after leaving the town of Gadara, known as the Gadarenes, where he ran into a demonized, mentally ill man who was naked and out of his mind, and Jesus spoke life into him, and when he left the man, he was clothed and in his right mind. And the principle there is Jesus will never leave you like he found you. And he crosses that Sea of Galilee seven miles and he enters into Capernaum. 
And this is what the word of God says. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. And we know this to mean later in this text that they were surrounding him. They almost pushed him into the sea. When you look into the Greek, his anointing, the anointing that came from the father was literally so strong There was a magnetic spiritual draw and crowds would follow him. And they wouldn't just follow him, they would surround him. A great multitude. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue. In Jewish culture, that would be like the lead pastor, the person of influence in that region. Came Jairus, which means whom God enlightens by name. And when Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. We know that to worship God is proskuneo. It means to fall at the feet. It means to kiss toward. It means intimacy. If you need a miracle this morning, it begins at the feet of Jesus. The first thing you need to do is humble yourself to the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the deliverer, the everlasting Father, the great I am, the one that heals diseases, the one that heals the brokenhearted, the one that will find you when everyone else has forsaken you. I'm talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus. It begins at the feet of Jesus and begged him earnestly saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. I'll translate that for you in a moment in the Greek. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. I love this journey of faith that Jairus had to make because Once he fell at the feet of Jesus, Jesus never left him. Now, a certain woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Very strange that she had this issue 12 years. 12 in the Bible means governmental authority. It means divine dominion. It's when things come together for a governmental shift. And this little girl of this very wealthy and and prominent person in religion is 12 years old, as well as the woman with the issue of blood has had the issue for 12 years. The issue of blood was what we would consider a sexually transmitted disease, even though we don't have clear evidence for that. We know that in that culture, a woman that had this issue had the reputation for being a very loose and immoral woman. And so she was an outcast. Whether she deserved it or not, we don't know. But she was desperate. Have you ever been desperate enough to do something you've never done before? To go somewhere you've never been before? To say something you've never said before? Ooh, to enter into a covenant you've never entered before? She had this for 12 years and had suffered many things for many physicians. She had tried to get this problem solved, but she couldn't find the answer through medical physicians. And I do believe that God will heal you through medicine and surgery. But there are times where there is no cure on planet Earth. You need Jesus to show up in your life. She had spent all that she had on a cure and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. I shall be made well if I can just get to Jesus. And The father of this 12-year-old girl, Jairus, had to elbow his way through the crowd. This lady 
had to fight through a crowd where women weren't welcome. She had to walk past the religious crowd that had judged her for her past sins. She had to walk by other rulers in the synagogue. She had to walk by soldiers and wealthy people. But it didn't stop her from getting to the hem of his garment. You see, if you just can touch Jesus for a moment, by faith you can be made whole through the healing power of Jesus Christ. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue in some translations or power went out of him, turned around and said, who touched me? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? In other words, we're surrounded by people. How are we supposed to know who touched you? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Yeah. Interesting word, the truth about the road she had traveled that led her to this point. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Somebody shout faith. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now keep in mind, Jairus being the leader of the synagogue, being a person of prominence, person of wealth, person of influence, he's desperate and he's done something for a religious man, a leader, a prominent person was also very controversial. Jesus the Nazarene was not who you wanted to connect with if you wanted to keep your religious prowess. He could have lost everything, but he loved his 12-year-old daughter enough to make his way to the Savior. But understand, along this journey of faith he was taking, Jesus didn't respond to him immediately. It didn't happen like he thought it was going to happen. He had to celebrate the miracle of someone else before he could receive his own. And the reason why some of us aren't blessed is because we can't celebrate God's favor on someone else. We can't celebrate God's miraculous power on someone else. We can't celebrate the journey of someone else. We think, oh, why can't it be me? Why do they get everything and they are always blessed and blah, blah, blah. Sometimes on this journey of faith, we must be patient. And faith is not just about miracles, signs, and wonders. Faith is about being patient and persevering in the process of life. And there are times where you're going to pray for things and you're going to feel like God is not listening to you or he is not answering you. The truth is he's strengthening you for a greater purpose. He's positioning you for something better. Hit your neighbor and say, better is coming. And we get to this place where Jairus' daughter remains ill. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. You know what that means in the Greek? D-E-A-D, -E dead. <laughs> Gone. gone why trouble the rabbi any further as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken he said to the ruler of the synagogue do not be afraid only believe Amen. someone say faith, faith. 
Faith, again, is believing in that which you can't see. Have faith. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. See, Jesus had 12, but he had an inner circle. Even among the 12, only three could go with him to certain places like the transfiguration and into a sick bedroom. Only three of them knew his heart to the degree that he trusted them. He knew they would walk in unity with them in that moment for a purpose. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly, which was of the Hebrew culture. When a person dies, they wail and they do this and they get loud and it's a process. Every culture has a way they bury the dead. If you think you don't, you haven't lived in the South very long. <laughs> there is a funeral culture. There is a wailing culture here in East Tennessee too. When he came in, Jesus said, why are you making all this commotion and weeping? For that child is not dead, but asleep. Child is not dead. Child is asleep. See, the enemies pronounced some of you dead, but I want to declare to you today that you're not dead. You're just asleep. But God's about to get you up for a divine purpose. God's about to raise you up to do what he's called you to do, to be a miracle to someone who needs it, to bring hope to the hurting, to bring, to bring grace to the afflicted. God is about to raise some of you up. You're not dead yet. If you've still got breath, you got purpose. And they ridiculed him, which that does mean in the Greek, they laughed at Jesus and mocked him when he said this. You see, the religious establishment doesn't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that they still exist. They don't believe that God can still do anything other than speak to you through words on a page. And the Bible's the inerrant word of God and he'll do nothing that contradicts that word, but there is a Holy Spirit. And that's what we operate under and in, in the kingdom. They laughed at him and they mocked him, but I love this part, one of my favorite parts of this entire passage of scripture. And when he put them out, when he put them out, you see, not everybody that came with you can go with you. He put them all out. I remember when my grandmother Gladys had a severe heart attack and she was older in age, but I wasn't ready to lose her. The family wasn't ready to lose Gladys yet. And they had done emergency open heart surgery, but they could not stop the bleeding. And her chest was open for seven days. And they could not figure out where the bleeding was coming from. They had called us all there to say goodbye. She was going to die. And I watched my father throw everybody out of that room that wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost. And I watched him say live. And I watched her live another eight years. And when she did go to heaven, her Bible was by her bed. Her slippers were by her bed. And she said for years, when I go, I just want to go to sleep. And that's exactly what God did for Gladys Phillips. She laid down and went to glory. I've seen creative miracles. Creative miracles have nothing to do with me or any other preacher. It has everything to do with Jesus and his anointing on that preacher. Yes. I was in Israel with Governor Huckabee, Brother Ken. It was a special time. I was the pastor for the famous bus. I don't know why I received that honor, but I enjoyed it. Famous comedians and being a country music fan, being with Josh Turner, who sang the long black train and preaching to him on a daily basis for 10 days was pretty, pretty neat. But at first I was starstruck <laughs> to the point Ken was making fun of me because I didn't really know what to say. 
I didn't realize he's just a humble guy that would drive all night from the Daytona 500 and come here and sing here and release his Christian album at Abbott's house and not take any money to do it Amen. except for his band. His wife, Jennifer, is a partner with Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. She's a friend of mine. We text, I pray for her children. They're all gifted like they are. Jennifer struggled with a number of ailments on that trip. And as I got to know the two of them, we were at Caesarea Philippi. And there were 350 people on this trip, but on my bus there was around 45 that I was leading and we were there. And that's one of my favorite places as well. I really believe that's where the fallen angels were cast down. The God of Pan was worshiped there. And that's why when Jesus said what he said, on this rock I'll build my church, it made sense. Because he was taking back ground from the devil when he said that. If you ever go there with me, we'll teach you more about that subject. She came to me after we had gotten to know each other and realized we had connections, family connections. She came and asked me to pray for her healing. And I knew that most of the people on the trip were very Baptist. not Baptocostal. <laughs> People always say, what are you? I said, we're still part of the Hamilton County Baptist Association. I said, we're like Baptists, you know, with a, you know, like a shot of Holy Ghost, you know, <laughs> you know. And uh, I was with a pastor from Kenya named Brian O'Kearing who walks in the power of God. He, he, he's amazing. He's a friend of mine. And uh, I had to tell 46 people to get out because I knew if she was going to receive her healing, I had to have somebody that believed in the power of the Holy Ghost with me. I had to have agreement. I had to have people that really believed God could do it. She came here and talked about that a few years later on a Sunday night, how God had healed her. And God will do the same thing for you. He's no respecter of persons, but sometimes you've got to get rid of those relationships that are holding you back. Sometimes if you're going to receive a miracle, you've got to get around people that believe you're worthy of that miracle. You've got to get around people that really believe God can do something. You are who you hang around. And we know from the Bible that if there is no agreement in the Holy Ghost, the miracle can happen. There are a number of reasons why it may not happen. It may not be God's sovereign will. I don't understand all of his ways, but I understand this, that it definitely won't happen if there's no faith and there's no unity and agreement in the room. And Jesus put them all out. He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered in where the child was, took the child by the hand and said, Talithia Kuma which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Or in East Tennessee, get up, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. One lady had perhaps lived a rough life. Jesus called her daughter. One young girl that was just entering into womanhood, he called daughter. That's what I love about Jesus, man. It, it, no matter what you've done, once you come to him, you're still his child. No matter what your past looks like, he'll still call you daughter. He'll still call you son. Immediately, she got up and walked, and they were overcome with great amazement. You see, she wasn't dead, but she was sleeping she was at the point of death and in the greek it's eskados echo ina and ina always means in the greek so that whatever god declares through his word if if you see the greek word ina it's a in a clause and it means there's a purpose for whatever god said or did and it means to be at the extremity and then echo to hold and possess. So she was at the end of herself 
and she was possessed by spirit of death so that God could lay his hands on her. You see, some of the things you've been through, you went through so that his works would be made manifest in your life. There is an inner clause that you've all walked through and what it means is that whatever you went through that was unfair, God has a purpose for it. And God's gonna use it to bring freedom to the captives. So she was at the point of death. There's a point of desperation that must come to your life if you're gonna receive your miracle. Some of you have never been desperate enough. And let me caution you this morning, begin to fall at the feet of Jesus because he's worthy, not because you're desperate. Now he responds to desperation, but you don't want to lose everything for a response from him. The point of desperation. So when you're at the point of desperation, if you're desperate enough for a miracle, you'll do something you've never done before. She was at the point of death for the purpose of a miracle. So whenever you're at the point of desperation, the first thing that happens is a determination must be weighed. How desperate are you? A determination must be weighed. Are you desperate enough to do something you've never done before? Are you desperate enough to fight through a crowd to get to his feet? Are you desperate enough to go somewhere you've never been before? Are you desperate enough to humble yourself and lay at the feet of Jesus? A determination must be weighed, but most importantly, a decision must be made. You must decide whether you're gonna live in yesterday or tomorrow. You must decide if you're gonna move forward or live in the past. You must decide if you want the miracle bad enough to sweat for it. You must decide if you want Jesus bad enough to be hated for it. Because he said if you follow after him, the world's gonna hate you for it. You've gotta decide how much of this Jesus you really want. Because if you want the real thing, it's gonna cost you everything. A determination must be weighed and a decision must be made. Oh, but there's a devil that must be slayed. Hallelujah. There's a devil that must be slayed. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. I know some of you have been abused. You've been abandoned. You had things happen to you when you were little. Daddy left. Mama left. You can't explain it. But you can't stay bitter if you're going to get better. you got to forgive that person. you got to change your destiny, your family line. You've got to take the fight to the devil. I remember in high school on Christmas Eve, Pastor Rodney Howard Brown, a good friend to this ministry and the wildest charismatic I've ever met in my whole life. His precious daughter died. And he calls our house on Christmas Eve in the 90s. And he held his daughter, this preacher, for 48 hours. Wouldn't let the hospital take her, wouldn't let the board take her because this man believed God was gonna raise her from the dead. And while she was laying in his arms, he called our home because God had released him to give up the body. What that man said, and he came here years later and preached a crusade for us, and we saw thousands saved all over the city. We sent teams out sharing our faith in Walmarts and in the streets. Rodney Howard Brown, my mother's up here, she'll vouch for every word of this. He said, the devil's gonna pay with a billion souls. And here's what I'm gonna tell you, man, If the devil's taking something from you, you can't be defined by that. You've got to take the fight to him. Fight the good fight of faith. And I'm here to tell you today, there's been more than a billion saved under his ministry. There's a devil to be slayed. And when you put on that armor, Pastor John, when you put on that armor, we know about the helmet of the salvation, belt of truth, shoes of peace, sword of spirit, all those things. But there is a shield of faith. Yes. And it's faith 
that will move that mountain. Yeah, she was at the point of desperation, but then there is power in desperation. When you get desperate enough, God will change your worry into worship. The Bible says, cast your cares upon the Lord and he will sustain you and he will never let the righteous fall. So if you're close to Jesus, they can hit you with everything they want to hit you with. Once they stop hating, you'll still be standing. It'll cause your crying to move into a season of change. See, sometimes God allows things so you will change. It's not about you. It's not even about your miracle. It's about the Holy Spirit transforming you from the inside out to make you better for the marathon. Amen. He'll turn your morning into dancing. It says in Romans 12 in the New Living Translation, we quote this all the time in the King James, but it says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to grow God's will for you, to grow in it and know it, which is good and pleasing and perfect. It will move you from whining into winning. I don't want to say too much today, but I got some rough and rowdy friends, but they taught me how to be tough. I had two older sisters. So it took brothers to toughen me up as a child. And they're not overly spiritual or prophetic. They're saved and I got to baptize them all. But every now and then, then you need a few friends that'll punch somebody if you need them to. Amen. I mean, you just, you know what I mean? Some of y'all that know me well can probably figure out who I'm talking about. But, but I'll never forget going through a difficult season. One of my childhood friends, tough guy, rough guy. He didn't know what to say. But he said, man, take the mindset you always did in sports and win. And I swear he wouldn't admit it or even have known it, but Jesus through him gave me a word that brought life into me. And the Holy Ghost will take your whining and turn turn it into winning. For his cause, not your own. And what I'll say to you is this, man, when everything comes against you, you stand up and you fight the good fight of faith. It begins with desperation. It says he took that precious daughter by the hand and said, arise. And she got up healed and whole. I want to tell you this morning that God wants you to rise. There is purpose for your desperation. Does anybody believe it this morning? There is purpose for your desperation. Desperation is not to bring depression. It's to bring dominion. What Adam and Eve lost in the garden, desperation will cause you to advance the kingdom of God. I believe if you need a miracle, it starts with desperation. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For him, all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, all were created through him and for him. So he is above it all. And when you're connected with a sovereign God, the son of God's radiance glory, he will use you, he will heal you, he will bless you, He will keep you. He will comfort you. He'll fight for you. He'll prepare a table in the presence of thine enemies. He will bring healing to your life. Jesus would say, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my father's house. There are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and I prepare a place for you. And where I go, I go so that you might be there with me. And they said, what are you talking about? We don't know the way. We don't know what you're talking about. They were still hoping 
for a kingdom on earth, a political governmental kingdom. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And I'm telling you today that if you need a miracle, it begins with desperation. You have to get tired of being sick and tired. You have to get tired of it, of being sick and tired. You've got to begin to work on your mind. The mind is a powerful muscle in your body. Whatever you believe about yourself, that's what you'll be. And what you say affects the mind. If you say, oh, I'm never gonna make it. I I can't be healed. This is just my destiny. You know, mom had this issue and grandma had this issue and I'm just gonna have it. That's just how we are. That's stinking thinking. Somebody's gotta believe God and shift it, amen, for the kingdom of God. And I believe that the power of desperation is to transform you so you can be a part of God's transformational process for others and your worship will change and you'll renew your prayer life and you'll begin to thank God and worship God. You'll begin to trust his kingdom sovereign will for your life. How many of you would say, Pastor Ronnie, I need a miracle or know someone who does? All of us. I believe you're a part of their healing. Would you stand on your feet with me this morning? There's two things I wanna do this morning. It's 1148. First, I wanna give you an opportunity to meet King Jesus, the healer, the savior of the world. If you don't know Jesus, if you're listening or if you're in the house. But the thing that the Holy Spirit told me to do comes second. No pastors today. No pastors down front today. I believe God is going to heal people of emotional issues and physical issues today. I really believe that with all of my heart. But it requires faith on your part and the unity of faith throughout the house. Amen? Amen. How many of you would start praying in your spirit right now for healing and believing for it at the same time? Everyone believing Jesus for a miracle today. While you're praying, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you say, if I, Pastor Ronnie, if I died today, I don't know where I'd spend eternity. I, I don't know Jesus. If that's you, just pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Please come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. If you prayed that prayer at the end of the service, I want you to go to my right and your left to the next steps area. Tell us who you are. We'll help you get started in your faith journey and we'll baptize you in a couple weeks. But for the rest of you, I believe God wants to heal you today. How many of you would say, Pastor Ronnie, I'm desperate enough or know someone who's in desperate need of a miracle. If that's you, I just want you to come down to the altar today. Don't wait, just come if you need a miracle today because you're in for a blessing today. The most powerful prayer warrior in my life is gonna pray for your healing today, not me. I got someone who I know walks with God, who's seen miracles. She's gonna pray today, not me. And so if you need a miracle, just grab the hand of a person beside you today. Because this is about Abba's house coming together in agreement. I believe when we have unity in the house, the Holy Ghost will heal some people. And I believe God's about to do it and do it in power. Amen. And no, I'm not giving a corporate word. I'm praying they just got my mic on. So don't start with your religion today. I believe God's about to heal somebody. God's about to heal somebody. Mama, come out here. If you need healing, just lift your hands up today and get ready to get healed in the name of Jesus. Somebody shout healed in the name of Jesus. First thing I want to do is for you to pray and say, thank you, Lord, for all the times you have showed up. Remind me, Lord, of all the times you have gone to bat for me because the enemy will try to steal that memory from you. And before I pray, 
I want to remind you that the Bible says that your hands are holy and you can lay hands on yourself and you can lay hands on others in the name of Jesus. So I don't know what you need today, but I know he will give it to you. So let's bow in prayer right now and hear me well. God loves you. God loves me. And all the times, Lord, you have been good to answer our prayers. You have come to us in the darkest hours of our lives. And Lord, I just want to thank you that we come to you as Father God, sovereign, creator of it all, maker of it all, keeper of it all, sustainer of it all. And you have the answer. I thank you that we come in the name of Jesus Christ our Savior and our Lord and our friend and our God who gave us the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, I thank you for the promises of your word. We can come to you and claim the word. You said, I am the God that heals you. You said, I will bring healing in my wings to you. So Father, we are desperate for healing today. We need you. Oh, God. Lord, we need a brand new touch today. Our strength from yesterday is gone. Increase our faith. Increase our boldness. Increase our witness. Right now, Lord God, I ask you to heal everyone in this room with their hands up. I ask that everyone in your family will receive healing today. I pray for the children today, God. Oh, how they need you. Oh, how they need you. Let them hear your voice and learn your word and learn of you. I pray for our teenagers, God. We claim them for God. And we want you to heal them for our young adults, for our families, we pray, Lord, for our marriages, for their life, for their bodies to be holy. I pray for our senior adults. God bless them every day. Give them strength and life. Restore to them what they need. I pray for our widows, Lord who are so needy because of their loneliness and their isolation. I ask that you heal them. And Father, we will give you the honor and the glory and the praise forever. For you are God and God alone. Thank you, God, that you've heard our prayer. Thank you, God, that we are holy even as you are holy and you desire for our healing. So, Lord, touch them. Touch them, Lord. And let them rejoice and claim it and walk in it and be confident of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.